Hola, welcome to season three of More Than Rice and Beans, the mother son podcast where we introduce you to our favorite Latinx creators, innovators, and entrepreneurs. I'm Miguel, a mechanical engineer PhD student at Johns Hopkins University, funded by a NASA fellowship. And I'm his mom, Tanya. I'm a chef, educator, and proud New Yorican. This season on More Than Rice and Beans, we've got, well, a lot more for you. More amazing guests, more ridiculous sidebar conversations, and more meaningful discussions on what it's like to navigate this world as a Latinx person. We're so excited you're joining us for this incredible season, along with our all-star lineup of guests. Get ready, because this time, it's way more than rice and beans. Welcome back to More Than Rice and Beans, your favorite mother and son podcast celebrating Latinx food, culture, and life. I'm Miguel. And I'm his mom, Tanya. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode. This is our last episode of season three. It's been an incredible season with our all-star guest lineup, and we're so happy to be ending with one of our oldest friends, George Torres. George is an award-winning bilingual social media slash cultural consultant who in the late 90s captured attention on the internet with his mission statement of connecting Latinos to their culture. Having been raised alter alternately between New York and Puerto Rico, he is a living embodiment of the New Yorican experience, earning him the nickname Urban Hivaro. Long before he was one of the industry's most well-known Latino marketers and cultural content strategists. George was a huge supporter of Koki the Chef, so this feels like welcoming him home. Thanks so much for joining us today, George. Thank you. And I just realized that that's Miguel, your son. Holy snap. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I'm, my mind is blown right now. <laughs> the mother said podcast. I I remember I remember us at Comic Con and he was like half the yeah. Oh wow. He was a little boy. Viejo pero mejor. Viejo pero mejor, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a pleasure being here. Thank you so much. I've uh I heard so many good things about the podcast. I got a chance to listen to it a couple of weeks ago, uh, just a, a snippet, because I don't get a chance to consume a whole lot of content these days. But uh, <laughs> I love what you're doing here. I love what you're doing. So I'm, I'm happy Thank to be you. here. Thank you. It's a pleasure having you. And I love to end the year with a fun and loving podcast. So we've known each other like forever beyond Comic-Con years. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Which absolutely. is actually 2017, for those of you who are curious. All right, George, so you're a man of many talents, but at your heart, I think you're a true storyteller. Why do you think sharing stories, especially about cultural heritage, is so important? I mean, uh, you know, my, my grandmother raised me, and I spent a lot of time in the kitchen with her. And the kitchen was our story time. That was, that was literally where I got to learn how to cook, find out about life, and just spend time and bond with her, you know, since my mom wasn't around at the time. And, um, and I just learned so much. And, you know, the kitchen is just a magical place for me. So I absorbed all of that energy. I absorbed all those stories. And in the Taino tradition of storytelling and passing information forward, I've, I built my business around that concept. You know, I built the business around uh, making sure that our narratives are told, that people recognize and see us in different forms of media. You know, I pretty much have, have been involved in every type of media except writing books. And I've been involved in writing books in some way, shape, or form, but I haven't written my own book yet. Well, I've, I haven't published it. Let me say that. It's written, but it hasn't been published. So where is it right now? So what happened was I've written the book and and world events have reshaped my thought process. You know, I'm, I'm constantly evolving. And, and one of the things, one, the, the last version of the book was supposed to be a guide on community building based on my philosophy of life, right? And one of the things that I realized is that the, the positioning of the book didn't feel right. I decided to rewrite portions of the book to kind of align with where I'm at today, where I've evolved to today. And where I've evolved to today is I, I really want to just talk, tell my story and let you take the pieces of it that you think may apply to your story or apply to your journey and then execute on that. 
if that makes sense. That sort of reminds me of a book I, I read many years ago. It was called Chicken of Your Soul, is it? Chicken Soup of Your Soul or something like that? Yeah, Chicken Soup uh, of Your Soul, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like a collection of stories from everyone. And that it brought that memory back of those uh, stories that were actually very impacting. They were stories you either can relate to or feel good about. So I'm looking forward to reading that book if you decide to publish it someday. Yeah, it's uh, it's called Social Sofrito. Oh, That's Social Sofrito. Sofrito. I like the title, yeah. <laughs> the title of it, yeah. And funny thing with Chicken Soup for the Soul, because when I started the website, obviously the, the name of the website is influenced by my grandmother and the Chicken mm-hmm. Soup for the Soul series. Um, they actually reached out to me and they uh, and they wanted to license uh, Sofrito for your soul for the book, but because I wasn't really a savvy business person at the time, I was very green and didn't know what that entailed, um, I kind of declined it. Um, and then they ended up coming out with Chicken Soup for the Latin Soul. So I, oh. so that was a missed opportunity. One of my big mistakes in my career was not, you know, actually partnering with them in a real way to make sure that, you know. And it's so funny because I eventually ended up working with lots of poets and, and writers and everything. And it, mm. it could have been a great, uh, it could have been a great uh, franchise for us, but it didn't work out. It's okay. Many more opportunities came after that, I'm sure. Absolutely. So what made you decide to leave your career as a chef to pursue this career as a curator of stories? So I became a chef by, I mean, I always liked cooking. You know, my grandmother, again, she she taught me how to cook. I became a chef for a couple of reasons. One, because girls thought it was cool. Um, it was- <laughs> No, I'm, I'm being so honest. you must have tons of tattoos on your arm and everything, no your hands. I have no oh. tattoos at all. That's part of the sexiness. No, 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 no. no <laughs> but um, but but I, I decided to become a chef because out of necessity because it was a high paying job at the time. Hospitality was a hot career in New York. It was very high paid. Um, I started working in a seafood restaurant in Queens called London Nenny's which my uh, as my wife at the time, her uncle worked there as the as the executive chef. Uh, so he brought me in as, an, as his apprentice and I stayed there for about a year and a half. And even though I was highly paid or higher paid than I've ever been in my life, I found out that uh, that going corporate would be uh, a better move. So I applied to work for Marriott Merrill Lynch, uh, Merrill Lynch headquarters on 250 Vesey, right behind the World Trade Center as it stood. And uh, and I worked there as a sous chef and I got paid almost double what I was getting paid in the local restaurant. And uh, I, you know, I started a, a career in corporate. That was my first, uh, my first uh, entry to a management position. I went from being a sous chef to being executive chef to then uh, doing purchasing, uh, what they call the master purveyor. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I covered um, Merrill Lynch headquarters, American Express headquarters, and Bank of Nova Scotia. So I bought, I bought all the supplies. I budgeted all the food for those three locations, those three different corporate dining locations. That's um, a big responsibility. It was, it was, yeah, it was it was cool. I was really young. I don't think I had the management uh, acumen yet, but you know, it was my first real big management position, and it was right out the gate. So it was it was it was a cool experience. Are there because- lessons that you learned from that that like you take into your current business? Yeah, I think that uh, working with different people, um, I think that I got a very deep sense of cultural awareness of people's work ethics. Um, and then some people may say that, you know, it, it's possibly stereotypical. Um, but no, there's different people from different places and they had different work ethics. You know, I worked with, uh, you know, Asian chefs. I were, you know, we had a very multicultural kitchen. So a lot of the food prep people were from the West Indies. A lot of the people who worked in the warehouse were from Mexico and Guatemala and Salvador. So I think the biggest lesson was working with people who were different than me. Um, so I, you know, I, I, I quickly found an affinity for learning about other cultures. So I think that my curiosity peaked being around so many different people. Um, the big missed opportunity for me was not talking to enough of the brokers, you know, having that, uh, that I'm your, uh, I'm the, I'm the help mentality and not really connecting with people who wanted to connect with me, uh, because I felt like I wasn't on their, on their status, um, and the reason why I say that is because I was around the most financially powerful people in the world. And there were some that were trying to teach me about stock and, and the markets and financial literacy. And I just, I wasn't ready for that lesson. 
and it took me 20 years to catch up, you know, uh, after that missed opportunity. So that's the kind of stuff I talk about in the book is like, you know, like how to connect with people and really try to, um, to, to get, uh, a full sense of where you're heading in life and then obviously learning from other people's mistakes. So the storytelling amongst people is probably the most important, uh, aspect of that. So tell us a bit about the beginnings of Sofrito for Your Soul. That's such a loaded story. Um, Sofrito for Your Soul uh, was started at SUNY College at Old Westbury. I was an undergrad at the time. I was 25. I was divorced with two kids. I had just left the, uh, the corporate dining. So I decided to go back to college. And uh, when I went back to college, I, I got into this media program. And I started learning how to, you know, edit, cut video. I was doing radio at, at school and, and the internet was a brand new thing. You know, this is the, the late 90s. And uh, I, I don't know, I came up with an idea of sharing my poetry on, on, on the internet uh, on a platform called GeoCities. And I called it Sofrito for, I, originally it was Sofrito for my soul. And then I, I swapped it out later for Sofrito for your soul. And I started the page and it was a very interesting project because I, I, I did it as a school project. I got an A on it. Uh, I was sharing my poetry and what would happen is I would start sharing the link with people. They would watch it and they were like, oh, I wrote something. You know, do you mind putting it up on the page? And I put it up on the page and then people were like, you know, they, they had guest books back then. It wasn't comments. It was guest books. Right. So people would sign the guest book and say, oh, my God, I love this poem. It reminds me of my abuela. Blah, blah. And it just kind of it kept rolling. You know, it just. uh we went from from sharing my poetry to sharing their poetry to to promoting poetry events in Long Island and the area of that I was going to college in, and uh, before you know it, we uh, we got a pretty international following. And uh, my first project that took it off campus, that took it off the screen, so to speak, was a project where we put together um, antojitos baskets for soldiers that Puerto Rican soldiers specifically that were in. Uh, in uh, Desert Storm, so people who were fighting in the war, we were we were sending them care packages with pilones and coquito and ajonjoli and you know all the little things that that they that would, sounds really uh, cool. Yeah, so and, and must that must have been really it, happy. And it's funny because that lady, the lady I was partnering with at the time, she had a website called antojitos dot com, oh. and she and I, and I don't know what happened to her. I, I really we lost touch, and I haven't been able to find her since. But um. But she was at the uh, she was at the foot of a Junque, like she had a warehouse there, and I actually went to Puerto Rico to visit her, and like we had a really cool friendship. I, I had a couple of really good friendships like that that started out in the early internet days, but but really the platform was meant. Uh, what it evolved into was a place for us to to tell our stories, for us to connect, for us to share movements, political movements, um, and and information that that honestly the school system didn't provide. You know, they didn't provide us with full history of who we are and everything. So right. I quickly connected with people like Bobby Gonzalez and Maria Ponte and, you know, to tell indigenous stories and, mm -hmm. you know, just just give us everything that we wish we knew, you know, especially coming from like a curious college mind. Right. So I kind of wanted it to be uh, an organization that created events similar to what we experience in college, but in the community. So those educational workshops, those, you know, uh, um, cohorts, you know, all that type of stuff. I wanted to have those opportunities in the, in the free community. Um, oh, yeah. So right after the, the website, you became very busy. I, I was extremely busy. Um, because of the website and the popularity of the website, it, it became very obvious that small businesses that were struggling to get on the Internet wanted help. And... Uh, you know, I, I just quickly became very popular in a very affluent part of Long Island for being the digital guy. Um, but then yes. I had this whole secret persona, the urban hero that yeah. like, you know, uh, that was like promoting culture uh, to people uh, who either were disconnected from it or people who loved aspects of our culture and wanted to learn more. You had talked before about some of your relationships with your grandma about cooking. And I know that that's something that my mom definitely can share like that, that side with you because she, she has a great relationship with her grandmother, which actually we, we have a podcast episode about, but is that what drew you to Cookie the Chef is that experience? 
Absolutely. When I when I saw Coquille the Chef, I said to myself, wow, like I'm a big fan of like Sesame Street and all the, the kids shows. <laughs> yeah. And and to see something that's such a, a cultural icon um, grab the attention of children and then bring them, you know, to do the workshops and sh- teach them how to prep food safely using plastic knives. Like that was really, really uh, innovative to me. Me and Tanya um, worked together in many different ways. Um but I was always super excited and I never, I never said no to anything she asked, like anything that she's, she's like, can you do it? Yes, let's do it. Like, <laughs> that is true. With the Comic-Con. Yeah, no problem. Let's do it. So, uh, but I, I really, you know, um, and I'm glad that you're getting your flowers now in the, in the community, but I, I really want to see you go into more places. I, I want to see you infiltrate more schools. I wanted to see you on TV. Like I had, you know, in my mind, I had like a whole vision of where this can go. Um, and, and a lot of it you've done, you know, so I'm mm-hmm. very proud of you. Um, but yeah, that's oh, thank you. literally, literally um, one of the more consistent brands that I've seen in the community over the years and my, my experience doing this has been Goki the Chef. Um, she never wavered from the original message. She's tried different things. She's experienced, you know, she's experienced uh, uh, different spaces and whatnot. But uh, and we were such a big hit at Comic-Con. Oh, my God. Everyone yeah. that walked by was like, "Cookie the chef, what? I want a flag. I want to." We had these little muñequitos that we were giving away. Like it was, it was really cool. It was, it was yeah. Big- and I'm sure nobody was expecting to have like sofrito dip at, at Comic Con. <laughs> oh, not you know, we we definitely we stood out. You know, um, we stood out as a team. Uh, the fact that she had you and and other uh, people in the family and friends, uh, children involved in the process. It was a very family friendly safe space for people to be curious about it um i think you sold tons of product if i'm not mistaken you used to, or you gave away you gave away some stuff one year i think another year yeah. you sold um, yeah. yeah it was it was a great experience but Koki the chef was definitely uh has definitely been a highlight of my career uh for sure you know participating in oh, and, you're just and making me blush experience. you're just uh, saying that to make me blush is bomb like literally one of my favorites in the, all of New York City, I'll say this like on a record. There's two there's two brands, two affin- brands that I have an affinity to. And one of them is 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 Coqui the Chef's uh uh Coquito. I I talk about it all the time. I don't get enough Aww. of it. I never seem to be in New York around the holidays, so um I, I haven't had a chance to have a bottle in a couple of years now but yeah always remember how good that looked. i remember going over there and getting like three or four bottles at a shot like well, the yeah. first time you tasted it was at where we were on npr yes yes and, and that was i think you were in shock with the fact that it was like wow this actually tastes good yes. <laughs> you know and then the whole team was like the whole team and the recording studio were like, oh, we got to give this a try. Everybody gave it a try and they were all shocked. Like they couldn't I think, believe I think I still that. Have my blue bottle. I think I still have yeah. my blue bottle somewhere around. Oh, yeah. that's cool. That's cool. You know, collector's item one day. So that like Comic-Con. <laughs> <laughs> that would be cool. Tasting or something or little tiny bottles of Coquito. Yes, absolutely. No, no, it was it was a great experience. And, uh, you know, I look forward to seeing what's what's next. You know, this this podcast obviously is a great evolution in, in telling stories about culinary art and 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 sharing recipes and everything. And I'm just I can't wait to see what else happens. Our mission is a little bit of everything in some ways. We we really want to tell our stories and other people's stories. We want them to be open to inspiration and grow from there so many things that we want to accomplish with this podcast and we're hoping to do that little by little not all at once and then hopefully people can absorb it little by little and process it and like it and then of course leave us some reviews <laughs> that will help <laughs> so yeah. you share your worst moments with through your stories and along with your past and what about sharing these stories with people outside the Latinx community? How have that been received? You know what? It, it's very interesting because I think that, that because we're a nation of immigrants, there's mm-hmm. so many people who have heard similar stories from their grandparents, whether they're Polish, Irish, Italian. Mm-hmm. Like the stories are similar. You know, the struggles are similar. It's just that, you know, Right now, our focus, you know, as Latinos is telling our story, right? Because yeah. our stories have been pushed aside. I think a lot of those other stories have been told quite extensively over the years. Um, a couple of years ago, I think 2010, 
I had the opportunity of becoming the Latino ambassador for the United Nations uh, for uh, a conference called, I think it was called 2020. It was like looking 10 years ahead type of uh, conference. Okay. And I got an opportunity to tell my story uh, about the racial violence and 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 my struggle to to launch a platform in the middle of a of an industry that was literally being born and and developing. We were making things up as we as we went. Uh, and I told those stories in the United Nations, and that was probably one of the most impactful things I've ever done because I got a chance to tell people about Puerto Rico or even introduce them to the concept of what Puerto Rico is as a colony mm -hmm. uh, to, to people from Czechoslovakia, to people from Africa. I had intense conversations with people from West Africa about our lineage and how we're connected, and they had no idea. They had no idea that there's a pueblo in Puerto Rico called Luis Aldea, which is, mirrors any West African village you go to. You know what I mean? So like, like that kind of thing really kind of like opened my eyes to seeing that, you know what, there, there is space for us on the global scene. And, and now with people like Mark Anthony, Jennifer Lopez, Bad Bunny, especially with, with people like that being so highly visible, people know that there's a Puerto Rico now. Mm -hmm. you know, when I go to Colombia, one of the most beautiful things I've ever experienced was going to Colombia. I'm in Bogota and I'm meeting a bunch of people at a bar that, you know, just people that they, they actually liked something I had on my shirt and they asked me questions and we just started chatting it up and they were like, where are you from? And I, do you speak Spanish really well? And I was like, yeah, I'm from Puerto Rico. And they were like, ah, bad buddy. And it was just like this, this welcome. <laughs> That's insane. <laughs> no, but, 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 but it, it, it goes to show how, you know, music and food are the two things that connect us all. Like, yeah. you know, and and when you start looking at the history of food and where food comes from and how we evolve, it's 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 a very deep story, right? But the fact that they knew who I was because of Bad Bunny or because of Nicky Jam or because of Daddy Yankee or whoever, it just shows like something about Puerto Ricans makes them happy. And and in Colombia, there's a very mm -hmm. special connection. In Colombia, there's a very special connection between Puerto Rico and Colombia because of their love for salsa. Mm -hmm. They always, always have listened when the when the gran combo estaba sonando like heavy in the streets. Like Colombia was the place where they made their money. They didn't make their money in Puerto Rico or New York. They made their money in Colombia. They made their money. Sounds in South like Florida. Menudo is the same thing. They exactly. made most of their money in Latin America. They made most of it because those people appreciate music and they didn't mm -hmm. need you to be a big name in order to support you. I know, I know reggaeton artists from East New York and from Bushwick that have gone to Colombia and sold out stadiums of 30,000 and nobody knows who they are and nobody plays their music in Bushwick. Wow. Because they just love music and they don't care if you're famous or not. But now, obviously, with the people who are famous, obviously, they, they're going to gravitate to that. So mm -hmm. the fact that I can go to Colombia and hear people talk to me in my accent as opposed to the other way around, right? Because we always, you know, we watch Pablo Escobar, we watch all these Colombian soap operas. Yeah. So we all, we all know the Colombian accent, but the fact that our little island our little montañita de, de tierra in the middle of the Caribbean has such a big impact in the world of music and culture is huge. And it's something I'm proud of. So when I go to Ecuador, when I go to Peru and, and Colombia, I'm always proud to say I'm Puerto Rican because I know they get it. They understand who we are as people to a certain extent. So I'm going to add something to that because one of the things that during COVID that I had to do, I had to pivot very quickly into online virtual cooking classes and Airbnb reached out to me and I said, hey, I had this really cool idea and we worked on it and we put it out there and it was a taste of Puerto Rico, coquito class and pastelillos. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, this is not going to go anywhere. This is not going to do anything. That same year, 2020, the month of December when the class was out, I was completely booked and one after another and was like, wow, people are curious about the Puerto Rican culture, because I put a taste of Puerto Rico holiday class because of Coquito. And then the year after that, I got people from France, from UK, Singapore. I had to wake up at five o'clock in the morning one time to give a class at 6 a.m. in Singapore, you know, for the virtual class. And I was like, how proud I felt to really teach people about our culture through food and not only that, because all of my classes, I always give like a short presentation of the history of Coquito and the music and the food. And they always are in awe and they appreciate it so much. 
And that for me means so much to me that at the end of the class, no matter how many times I've given it, I always feel really good about it to share something special. What you don't realize is that just those interactions, whether they be virtual or real life, they're going to inspire other versions of our food, other versions of our drinks. And you're going to be the, you're, you're, you're ground zero for that person or for that community that's being introduced. Um, and I think I said, we said this when we did the Coquito episode for NPR, uh, we talked about, you know, Irish Bailey's cream. You know, yeah. it used to be a holiday drink. It was something that was only for the holidays. And, you know, people drank it around Christmas. And then January, nobody drank it again until next, you know, November, whatever. Yeah. And um, I think Coquito is on the verge of being a year-round drink. I think that there's a couple of key players in the space that are actually pushing for that. And that's what Irish Bailey, that was the success of Irish Bailey Cream. They specifically found ways to to incorporate co- not coquito their drink into uh, year round activities so that people always had a way to enjoy it and it wasn't just there's no reason why coquito should be tied to the holidays. I have coquito yeah. limbed in July and coquito yeah. limbed is just frozen coquito like yeah not the rum you know so 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 you you are responsible for somebody else's inspiration somebody else is gonna make some type of mofongo fusion something with Singapore noodles or whatever, like something's going <laughs> to happen and you're going to be the reason for it, you know? And, and that's amazing. That's amazing that you're such a strong ambassador for Puerto Rican culinary heritage that, mm. that, that you could, that you could be that for somebody. And, and I think that we should never underscore, like we should never discount our, re- our impact on other people. Sometimes we, we won't see it. You know, somebody may never mention it to you or you may never be, within earshot to be able to hear your name mentioned in Singapore, Mm -hmm. but it's happening, but it's happening. You're absolutely inspiring other people to do new and different things with what they learn from you. Well, thank you. So Frito for Your Soul turned 25 this past year. So when you started Sofrito, most people were still using dial-up internet and Google didn't even exist. Now you're working with social media influencers who share their stories in real time with millions of people worldwide. Has technology changed the way we connect with our own culture? And what's one thing you wish you could bring back from the 90s version of the internet? Is the dial-up like an eh? I don't think anybody would say that it's that I love sound. <laughs> it's very interesting for me to be the first Latino blogger in the form of blogs that existed in, in 1997 and look at what the space has become. Like, you know, like literally there was nobody else sharing Latino stories on the internet when I started. So the fact that, you know, that I could look out and see that every single person that came after me, that, you know, like I just see them evolve and see them develop amazing careers. It just makes me want to be part of that pipeline, which is the pipeline I keep talking about. Right. Um, the one thing I would want to bring back from the nineties is me hinta.com. Me hinta.com. Me hinta.com. A lot of people don't know the true history of Latinos on the internet. Everybody thinks it starts with MySpace. That's where everybody's focal point is, right? The social networking thing started. But four years before MySpace was a thing, we had our own space online, right? Um, We moved from AOL, the the dial-up world, right? The AOL uh, World Garden, and then the internet opened up. When the internet opened up, I moved the website from GeoCities to its own domain because they were allowing people now to, to register domains instead of just companies. So I registered sofritofreesoul.com. And we make it out to the open internet. So this company called Community Connect decided to create three platforms that mirrored the illusion of an AOL walled garden, like a closed space where everything was contextual, right? And those three websites were Black Planet, Asian Avenue, and Mihente.com. Mihente.com had 3 million users five years before MySpace was a thing. So we really pioneered social networking in a lot of ways on the internet. Historically, we are known, you know, there's Asian websites uh, that were, you know, in Asia and Europe that pioneered it on their end. And in the United States, really people of color really built the social networking infrastructure. What, What Mi Gente was then is what Facebook is today. 
You know what I'm saying? Same, same dynamic, same messaging, the, the network. But the thing was that the topics were constricted to that cultural group, right? So Asian Avenue talked about the Asian American experience, Black Planet, the Black American experience, and Mi Gente, the Latino experience. But there was such a, uh, there was such a, a, a unity in having everybody collecting content in one place. Cool. So, okay, now we're talking about the 90s version of the internet and what we would bring back. What about any uh, music? What would you bring back from there, that moment? Music? Man, listen, I... I like I like old school salsa. You know, it's always gonna be for me. It's always gonna be that gran combo. Like you know, everything. I love Mark Anthony. Don't get me wrong, but I feel, I think that that was like a line in the sand. I like the old conjunto uh, versions of salsa. The the sonora ponceña, a gran combo. How about freestyle? I like freestyle, but freestyle had its moment. <laughs> it's, it's, Good. Yeah, it sure did. I mean, it brought together a lot of these uh, Hispanos that knew how to sing and they just sang all their, their heart out. A lot of the songs will have to do with love and breaking up and getting back together and, <laughs> you know. So, and, you know what, and, I, and I give you an example. I think that my, my uh, I have a lot of friends that are freestyle singers that are famous and they're going to hate me for saying this, but the, the, the genre never grew. The genre never got away from that planet rock, you know, bass beat that they started with. You know, the, the genre just never grew. And and it's very interesting because if you look at reggaeton and then has it evolved into urban and now evolved into, uh, you know, into dembo, like all the different genres that have come out of reggaeton, that's the growth that we were looking for, for, for freestyle. And it just never happened. It just stayed and it stayed very localized. It was something that only Puerto Ricans and Italian Americans from New York and Staten Island liked. And it just never, you know, and then it, it, it migrated a little bit towards like Florida and that was it. Like that's really a North, like you never hear those freestyle songs in the West Coast. Like nobody knows who Judy Torres is. Or like, you know, it just never grew. It's just like house music in a way that. I think that Instagram and TikTok is bringing back house music. And I think that's kind of cool. It's feels nice to hear some songs that really impacted us when we were young. And they're like, wow, they're playing this in TikTok and they're dancing to it. How cool is that? You know, it's really nice to see that. I wish Freestyle would hit that mark too. I mean, it could. I mean, you know, Judy, Judy's still doing her thing. You know, uh, Tony from TK is still doing his thing. There are people out there that are keeping the movement alive, but I just... I just fear that they're not gaining new audiences. It's just it's just restricted to the you know the people who are doing the reminiscent you know thing that they're, oh yeah I'm getting together with my friends from high school we're gonna go to see Judy Torres, you know and and that that's that's where you know so I would have liked to seen it grow. I was a big freestyle actually. I started working. Fun fact about me: I worked at Hot 97 before it went hip hop. So it was Hot 103 and it was a freestyle station. And when freestyle kind of died down. They swapped it over to old school hip hop, which was old school at the time, which was really, really old school now. But they, 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 um, they, they had swapped the format, and I started working there at, at, at now Hot ninety seven, and uh, I saw, you know, I got to witness kind of the death of the freestyle movement on the radio. So that was really sad. That was sad. Let's revive it. Let's revive it. Let's do some TikTok videos on freestyle. Come on, let's do it, George. We can do it. I'm not gonna do dancing, but I, I, I will. I will. I promise you, I will do one freestyle TikTok just for fun. I will tag you. I will. I will credit you with inspiration. What is your relationship with cooking now? Since you were a chef before, um... I, can't, I can't get out of it, man. It's a, it's the same reason. <laughs> I mean, I'm a I'm a hardcore foodie, and those of you who know me know that I travel quite a bit. I'm I'm pretty much on the road 24 days a month, 24 25 days a month. I'm out of, out of, outside of New York, so I'm traveling all the time, and I'm eating and experiencing all kinds of foods on a regular basis. And I don't create enough content around that just because I don't have time because of my agendas in these different cities. But um, but most recently, I um, I decided to become partners with um, with the folks that have been managing my career for the last four or five years, um, Christy Clavi Hokish, uh, formerly of Hispanicize. She's one of the founders of Hispanicize, and then Maria. Um, I'm sorry, Michelle Rodriguez Tapanes, uh, who is her business partner. Um, we worked on a big COVID project for New York together, which has a whole story by itself. But um, 
we 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 worked on this project. The project was a rush project. We did it in less than eight weeks. We ended up getting nominated for a Tele Award and winning a bronze Tele Award for it uh, with the Exposito, the agency that that actually um, masterminded the whole thing. So we decided to partner up, and um, yesterday, just yesterday, we announced Tu Cocina, which is a collective of uh, kitchen creators, professional chefs, recipe uh, developers and other f- types of food creators. We created a division within the company that specific, uh, specializes in food uh, in food campaigns and, and working with influencers around food and, and culinary heritage. Um, so I'm very excited about that. So I can't, I can't seem to get out of the kitchen, no matter what, either the brand is connected to the kitchen, it has like a name that's connected to food, like everything is food for me. So what is your best meal? What is the best meal you ever had? The best meal I ever had? Anything my grandmother made, like sancocho, rice and beans and chicken. It doesn't have to be fancy, like nothing fancy. It's just her staple dishes were the best. The one thing that I make a lot that people love when I make, and my friends always ask me to make it for them, is I, I've become really good at making jibarito sandwiches. So jibarito sandwiches are something that was developed and made popular in Chicago. I, I'm fortunate that the the gentleman, Don Jose from Borinquen, uh, the, the restaurant in, in Chicago actually taught me how to make them. So I learned from the, uh, the originator. Um, but I created a YouTube video and that YouTube video went pretty viral for the time. It didn't go millions, but it went within our circle. It went pretty viral. Uh, it's basically a sandwich. It's a steak sandwich, chicken sandwich. Now they even do them with vegan, with eggplant. And it's basically instead of you replace the bread with totones. So, uh, so if you've ever been to South America, they call them patacones. In, in, in Venezuela, in Colombia, they call them patacones. But basically, they, their sandwich is created with, with totones instead of bread. What do you remember from your grandmother's sancocho? What feeling does it give you? You know what? I won't even talk about the feeling. I will talk about the magic around the sancocho. My grandmother would make a big, she had a big, big pot, which we still have in the family today. And when she made this pot of sancocho, it didn't matter if there was five people in the house or if there was 50 people in the house. There was always enough for everybody. I never knew how she did that. Like, it's just like a magical memory. It's just like, wow. Like, she just had me take soup to 10 neighbors. Like, how do we have enough? It's like the the purse from Mary Poppins where she just kept on, like, taking out. Exactly. More exactly. Stuff. So, and I get, a, I get emotional when I think about it because my grandmother created relationships through food. She She knew... She was a social worker and she worked with the Department of the Elderly, but she worked with a lot of people who were addicted, that had a lot of other problems that were of that time. And it didn't matter what you were, if you were a junkie, if you were drunk, if you were whatever, like she knew that you needed to eat and she would invite you in. Like people came into my house on a regular, if you were hungry in my neighborhood, consider my house the soup kitchen. My grandmother would feed you, no questions asked. And, and that just stuck with me, you know, that the fact that we could be like, nobody should ever be denied a plate of food. And that's something that, that, you know, that, that sticks with me today. So, yeah, so that, 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 the the Sancocho was the magic. Um, I think that one of the, the most, the deepest memories I have is just her feeding people and sending Sancocho out and just creating relationships it's it's lovely the way you spoke about your grandmother and the way I speak about my grandmother. I sometimes think about, am I going to be a grandmother like that? Or am I going to be slightly better or slightly worse? <laughs> I always think about that. I was like, I, I want my grandmother to be my role model for when I'm old and have my grandchildren and stuff like that. So I know how that feels to be connected with your own grandmother. Well, the one thing about your legacy as a grandparent and and my legacy as a as a grandfather, I have a beautiful new granddaughter named Edie Priscilla, who was just born a couple of months ago. And um, one of the differences is that they're gonna see evidence. Like you and I, you and I are talking about our grandmothers of what based on memories. We're telling stories. We're giving oral tradition, right? But one of the things that's very different is that they're gonna be able to see your work and your legacy. They're gonna be they're gonna be able to see video of Koki the chef. They're going to see you at Comic-Con. They're going to see you giving, feeding people in the community. They're going to see you educating children. They're going to see all of that. They're going to be able to see, that's my grandmother. That's the difference between, you know, when you talked about the difference between the 90s internet and now is that we're actually documenting everything. So, so 
does help. Because you never know, like you may have a great, great grandchild that you never get to meet and they may look back in the archives and get completely inspired by your work and completely take over and, and do something different with what you what you created. Before you go, we have some rapid fire questions for you. Are you ready? Yep. Okay. Favorite book of all time. Favorite book of all time. Um, crushing it. Crush it by, uh, by Gary Vaynerchuk. Podcast or music? Podcast or music. Podcast these days. What's another language you would like to learn? I would. I'm torn between Chinese and Portuguese. What's your go-to lazy dinner? My go-to lazy dinner: macaroni and like Velveeta shells and cheese with ground turkey. What story do you tell the most often? Anything having to do with my grandmother. I think that that's if you go online and Google me, that that's the story that I've told the most in my life. Is is the different ways that she impacted me? Your favorite social media platform. This makes me sad. It was tw- it was Twitter. Um, it's disappointing me these days because, and it's not because I I can still do what I want to do on Twitter, but it's because it's because uh, people are leaving Twitter, so it's taking away some of the community that I built over the last twelve years on Twitter. What's something exciting that's happening in your life right now? I'm free. I'm free. I know. I'm free. I don't have to worry about um, like different things regarding career, whatever. I made my own career. I have complete control over everything that I do. What is the best advice you've ever received? Alo foke. Happy in Spanish, English, you know, um, and I'll give you context. Um, mira, puede ser que te voten porque no, el jefe no puede pagar los salarios que tú quieres. Alo foke. Whatever happens, happens. Like, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a word that just has like no meaning and all the meaning at the same time. In, in context, you get it. Out of context, it's like, what are you saying? In context makes complete sense. George, thank you so much for being our final guest of season three of More Than Rice and Beans. We keep calling this our all-star season, and I can't think of a better way to end it than with you leading our listeners and with us to more inspiring and unforgettable Latinx folks. Um, where can we find you to keep up with your work? Right now, uh, I'm really focused on uh, the work that I'm doing with Talento Unlimited. So if you go to talentounlimited.com to the contact page, you can get to me directly uh, on, on social media, Urban Hibaro on all platforms, including TikTok. And especially now that I have to do the freestyle dance. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. So oh. be tuned in for the freestyle dance. Yes. Submit a link to that TikTok video. I'll put it in the show notes. George, it was great having you for our season finale. I can't wait to see what you will do next. As for us, we'll be back soon for another season. Yeah, so season four will be dedicated to empowering women, and you'll be able to catch new episodes of More Than Rice and Beans in March 2023 or earlier. In the meantime, we'd appreciate it if you left us a review, especially on Apple Podcasts with five stars. Thank you. Uh, letting us know what you thought of our incredible guest in season three. If you miss us too much, head over to kokidechef.com and sign up for our cooking class. Check out our blog, listen to past podcast episodes. Thank you, everyone. Ciao. George, say goodbye. Bye. <laughs> no. Que Dios lo cuide y nos vemos por ahí. Si me ven en la playa, cómprame una piragua. <laughs> <laughs>